Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphne Stereotis, and I'm an associate with CAQH Core. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our May Town Hall. We have a lot to cover during this session. Uh, it's been a busy year. We'll start off with an overview of CORE um, and give it a little industry update. We'll then give a spotlight on the CAQH endpoint directory before diving into operating role development and maintenance activities. We'll then go into an overview of our CORE certification and measurement program before concluding today's session with a questions and answers period. So a few logistical items here as we get started. A copy of the slides and the webinar recording will be emailed to you all tomorrow afternoon. You can also download the slides now and follow along on the GoToWebinar dashboard on the right of your screen. As we go through today's topics, I want to encourage you all to submit questions for today's Q&A at any time by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. So with that, let's get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, CAQH Core Director, Erin Weber. Erin. Thanks, Daphne, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I know we have almost 100, or I'm sorry, 400 registrations. So we are excited to share with you uh, some of the great work coming out of CAQH Core and across the industry today. Before we get into the details, we can move to the next slide. I want to give a little bit of overview for those of you that are new to CAQH Core. Uh, CAQH is a nonprofit organization with a mission to simplify the business processes in healthcare, and CORE is one of the initiatives uh, that is part of CAQH. We are an industry-led group of providers, health plans, vendors, government entities, associations, standards organizations that come together to develop operating rules to accelerate interoperability across the industry. Our participating health plans represent about 75% of the insured U.S. population, um, we are designated by the Secretary of HHS as the National Operating Rule Author for the HIPAA Administrative Transactions, and we are governed by a multi-stakeholder board of directors. Uh, we see our role not only to develop operating rules, uh, but really through an integrated model that includes convening the industry, vetting and testing requirements, uh, deploying new operating rule sets, um, but also driving adoption through our certification program, measuring impact through our measurement uh, and ROI efforts, um, and continuously doing research to update and identify new needs for the industry, as well as doing education programming like today's session. Next slide. This next slide just highlights some of the uh, organizations that are participating with us. If your organization is not a participant, we really encourage you to reach out to us to learn more about the benefits of contributing to uh, the operating rule development and maintenance process. Next slide. So for those of you that are uh, less familiar with our work, you might be wondering what are operating rules. Well, um, operating rules are defined under HIPAA as the necessary business rules and guidelines for the electronic exchange of information, not defined by a standard or standard or its implementation specifications as adopted. Um, so uh, operating rules cannot repeat or conflict with what is a standard, but they build on and support the standard. Um, so they are really crucial in today's world if you think about both the information within a transaction, the data content, and also the infrastructure, the expectations about how, when, um, and through what mechanisms that information is exchanged. Next slide. Um, to date, uh, CAQH Core has developed and its participants have developed eight sets of operating rules, uh, three of which have rules that are federally mandated through HIPAA. Those are the rules in pink here. Um, we recently reorganized our operating rules from phases to be um, organized around the business transactions that they support. And so you can see here. Um, organizations are able to become core certified in each of the individual rule sets. Um, which really support the entire healthcare revenue cycle. Next slide. 
Um, we work with a number of federal organizations and government agencies. Um, the two I want to highlight here are federal advisory committees whose work are very closely related to the work that CA2H4 and many of you are doing in your own world. Um, the first is the HITAC Advisory Committee, which makes recommendations to OMC on standards and other interoperability issues. Uh, they meet regularly and most recently have been looking at recommendations for the US CDI uh, efforts around those core data elements um, and also are, uh, have an interoperability standards priority task force uh, that is helping uh, prioritize interoperability needs in the um, interoperability standards advisory tool that ONC offers, as well as identifying priority use cases. The National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics is sort of the complementary advisory body to CMS on issues related to health data statistics, um, as well as um, the HIPAA administrative simplification requirement. Um, most recently, NCDHS has been prioritizing building on some of the work they've done around creating a more predictable uh, roadmap for standards and operating rules, as well as thinking about the alignment between clinical and administrative transactions. Um, they, in this year, have indicated a desire to focus on integrating APIs into HIPAA and um, an initiative around social determinants of health. So we look forward to seeing uh, what comes out of both of these committees over the course of 2021. Next slide. Uh, I would be remiss to give a federal update if I didn't talk about um, a couple other items that I know are impacting your organization. Um, the first is a prior authorization rule that came out um, late last year, um, was finalized in early December, but has been um, uh, put under review by the Biden administration. So we are waiting for updates related to this. This rule really um, included some requirements to address some of the challenges related to prior authorization and reduce the burden on providers and patients. Um, we CORE submitted a comment letter and there's a link here if you're interested in the uh, comments that we provided here. Um, we know many of your organizations are also preparing uh, for the No Surprises Act. Um, which relates to uh, transparency related to um, uh, uh, patient costs uh, related to their health care. Um, and, and very significantly, the HHS interoperability rules um, have a number of deadlines over the course of this year uh, into next year that your organizations are likely preparing for as well. Um, CAQH recently launched a new uh, endpoints directory, which is directly tied to some of the needs and requirements laid out in these rules. And our colleague, Rachel Holstein, will be giving us an update about that in a minute. Next slide, please. Another area of interest we have heard from our participating organizations and across the industry is uh, the need to better support telemedicine, obviously with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, there has been a significant rise in the use of telemedicine, which has also led to um, greater, um, you know, impact of telemedicine on revenue cycle functions. And so uh, CAQH, both uh, organization-wide and within CORE, have been assessing how we can help the industry um, with this increase in telemedicine uh, visit. So um, very specifically within uh, CHQH, the CHQH ProView tool um, has been um, updated to enable providers to indicate whether they are able to see patients virtually. Um, and we have worked with the uh, states and AMA on this so that plans can include this information in their online provider directories. Uh, we are also working on a virtual care directory data framework. So um, moving forward, thinking about how best um, this information can be used by a health plan to implement changes in their own provider directory to include uh, greater virtual care information. So um, that's an ongoing project. Within CORE specifically, we have three different areas um, that are being impacted um, by this interest in telemedicine. Um, the first is our work in eligibility and benefits. So my colleague uh, Taha will give a detailed update on that work effort in a minute. Um, but there, we are reconvening a task group to update our eligibility and benefits data content rule. 
um, as that rule hasn't been updated in several years. And some of the options the task group is considering in its update um, relate to how telemedicine benefits should be returned, including the potential to establish uniform MSG segment requirements to communicate telemedicine uh, services, and also require that health plans follow some recommendations coming out of X12 to explain coverage for telemedicine benefits. Within our core code combinations uh, task group, and, and that is the group that maintains um, a set of CARC and RARC and, uh, uh, group codes uh, that are included on the remittance advice transaction to indicate whether why a claim has been denied or adjusted. That work group will evaluate the need for any additional information within these uh, business scenarios. Um, during their uh, 2021 market-based review cycle, which will occur uh, next month. Finally, our education and outreach team has been working with WEDI to conduct uh, a series of educational webinars focused on telemedicine uh, starting this summer. So we look forward to keeping you updated on the progress related to these activities. Next slide. Um, finally, you're going to hear about all of these uh, initiatives um, in more detail as we, we go through the presentation, or at least a couple of them. Um, but I want to highlight the um, significant amount of work that the four participants are doing right now to both uh, update and create new operating rules. Um, we have some really committed co-chairs um, from our participating organizations that are really driving this work effort. Um, we are looking at developing new attachment operating rules and, and specifically focused on both a prior authorization use case and claims use case um, and anticipate that those rules will be finalized by the end of this year. Um, I mentioned the eligibility and benefits work and the code combination work that is ongoing, um, as well as continuing to work on our pilot and measurement initiative um, to um, understand the impact of operating rules and moving to more electronic processes, um, particularly around prior authorization and attachment, um, but also quality measure reporting. So we look forward to continuing to keep you updated on our progress throughout this year. Um, and at this point, I am going to turn it over to Rachel Goldstein, who is a senior manager with CAQH4, to talk more about the CAQH input directory. Rachel? Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here today. We could move on to the next slide. So you did hear Erin just mention the CMS patient access and interoperability rule and the national utility I'll be speaking to you about today, the CHH endpoint directory is intimately related to that. So I'm going to speak to you a little bit about um, what's required there in the rule, um, kind of some, some problem areas or challenges this may present for industry in terms of, as well as opportunities, but some of the challenges that were um, left the uh, gap in the rule, and then how the CQH endpoint directory is uh, serving to meet the needs of those gaps for industry. So here, um, just for those of you that may not be intimately familiar, the CMS final rule requires all CMS regulated plans to do kind of three different things. Um, implement and maintain openly published HL7 fire-based APIs, and this is to provide patients access to their health information and information about it in network providers and formulary information. To permit access to data by third-party applications with approval or by direction of the member. And to support the electronic exchange of data for care coordination as patients move between plans. So what does this exactly mean for for health plans. So the final rule really, as I'm sure many of you know on the line, is changing the game in terms of how patients access their own data and how they're able to share it with other entities within their care network. Um, because the final rule stipulates that for certain efforts to share this patient data, the plans have to change, have to be able to share the info through fire-based APIs, it is important to know what the endpoints are for the um, supporting them APIs from the plan. Um, most of the plans that are impacted by this rule are at, are at varying stages of, of preparedness or maturity to be able to address these requirements. The 
Um, first kind of piece of it uh, is enforceable in July 2021 for the patient access API, and then the following year for the um, for the pair to pair data exchange. Now, a single source of truth for this endpoint and third party app information was noted that from, from key industry players, including the Office for the National Coordinator of Health IT um, Fire at Scale Task Force, or ONC FAST group, as a major gap to implementing uh, Fire at Scale, um, especially with respect to the CMS uh, final role. So CAQH was approached to consider addressing this gap by creating a national utility and helping to kind of solve this at, at a national scale as we do with, with many of our utilities. So we can go to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit more about why this was a gap. So the problem space, I'll dive into it a little bit more, and then I'll speak about how the utility serves to address the gaps. So assuming that there are about 689 CMS regulated pairs, that means that the use of mass, there would be over 237,000 possible plan to plan connections that need to be established. This is assuming that every health plan needs a connection to every other health plan, right? Um, and then when the plans go to implement and comply with the, with the, uh, the regulations in the CMS final rule, these, these connections that, that need to be established must, must address various things like security, privacy, all the different use cases that are within uh, the universe here, um, ongoing governance, and the list goes on. And plans are also required to grant API access to third-party app vendors, which brings up some additional challenges we'll chat about, so not just the pair to pair. So let's see what it would look like for a health plan to receive requests like this uh, today without a centralized trusted utility to help out. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, plans are required to make uh, a mem to make it, uh, member information available to the um, to the members app uh, to the members app of their choice when directed by the member. So as a health plan, plans can notify members if an app doesn't seem trustworthy, but the rule doesn't provide a ton of flexibility for rejecting the app request um, unless there's a severe, severe security threat. So this means that a health plan would need to authenticate the app vendor, verify privacy and data protection policies, ensure each vendor understands and is proficient with Fire APIs, both standards and security, and do some testing on the applications for various use cases. So, Health plans may be on the more mature side of the spectrum, and maybe they've already set up their own development portals to collect some of this information, um, or, or maybe they're working more in kind of a spreadsheet environment that the app vendors can fill out and, and email to someone on the plan's technical team. So this, there's a wide range of what this could kind of look like in the absence of a national utility. But in either kind of side of the spectrum, trying to play tech support for every vendor that might want to share, that a member may want to share their data with is pretty burdensome for the plan. And also not to mention, you know, not a great experience for the app vendors themselves either. So to complicate things even further, um, you know, working with the app vendors is only one piece. The plans also are going to need to connect with each other for the pair to pair data exchange. So if you can go to the next slide, and we'll just call out a couple things couple challenges for that use case as well, the pair-to-pair -pair data exchange part of the final rule. So, you know, let's say for, for example, a member is moving from one plan to another plan, which is very, very common. Um, and, you know, they want to be able to access their data that was stored at their prior health plan. So obviously that's going to prompt a need for the plan to connect with another plan. Um, but where, do, where, where would you even begin there? So, like I mentioned, each plan is really responding to this in its own way, and making these connections looks a little bit different for each plan to other plans. So it, it may mean going to health plans' websites, it could mean finding a phone number, making a call to the plan to find the endpoint. There's really no consistent approach at the moment in the absence of this national utility that CEQH has created. So this is um, this is really uh, 
a challenge. And basically this process to connect with the plan just that you see on the screen, I mean, this is just for to, uh, to fulfill a request for one plan on its own, let alone having to repeat this over and over and over again to meet member needs. So this is, you know, as a result of, of these challenges I've just described that are facing plans and app vendors when trying to comply with the final rule, um, you know, industry bodies such as ONC FAP, Da Vinci, and other players have, have identified the need for the endpoint directory as a critical solution to help comply with this rule and overcome some of these scale barriers. So as we move to the next slide, the CAQH endpoint directory is serving as that national directory of payer fire endpoints that securely publishes these endpoints as well as third party applications um, into a single source of truth that is um, consistently uh, governed and updated. So some of the benefits to, to plans and third party app vendors, so it easily, um, it provides an easy place for health plans to connect in one place save time with establishing and maintaining connections with other plans. Um, it provides confidence and integrations with those third-party vendors that will be coming to plan on behalf of a member. And it does help um, to meet compliance requirements for the federal regulations. So some of the key things that it does here, it will be verifying um, payer and third-party app participant identity into the directory. It confirms, collects information about privacy, security, data use, um, policies, and agreements um, that the third-party app vendors uh, will provide as information to the directory and can be accessed. Um, I should mention all of this can be accessed via UI, but also by fire resource APIs um, within the directory for payer use. Uh, it offers some testing and validation to show how the apps can work with buyer endpoints um, and allows payers to share information about their endpoints that can be obviously searchable by other plans as well as third party vendors. And finally, facilitates these connection requests between parties to streamline the overall process. So we did launch on April 21st. And we're inviting third party app vendors working with patient data as well as health plans to come on into the utility. Um, there's a URL at the bottom here where you can find out more. I do believe these slides will be shared. Um, so you should be able to click on that, but an easy way to find this is just to go to the, uh, the CAQH website as well. If we can go on to the next slide. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that to build this utility, we consistently worked with major players and in uh, major industry organizations, some of which you see on the screen, including a, a devoted group of plans and third-party app beta testers and our, our work group that provided some exceptional uh, early feedback on into the utility. Um, and I would I, I also just want to mention, and I think I did that. You know, we participated in testing our utility and its flows against industry standard implementation guides and work, including the ONC FAST processes and some of the DaVinci IGs, and we will continue to do that, of course. So, you know, as we refine our roadmap, um, working through these uh, working through these channels to get continuous feedback and engagement, um, you know, has been really beneficial. And and some areas that we're considering on our roadmap for the future include uh, addition of provider endpoints, a more formalized trust framework for plans that builds on what we already have in the utility, uh, potential support for some more automated registrations such as UDAP, and using existing CAQH assets to support accurate patient matching and identification of prior coverage. And this is something that's especially important for that pair-to-pair -pair use case within the final rule. Um, all of these areas of feedback that are on our roadmap, um, again, would be remiss if I didn't thank all the um, organizations uh, within industry that have provided exceptional feedback for us on uh, the utility as it stands today, as well as our near-term roadmap. So if you um, if you go to our site now, you can see a list of some of our early adopters as well, if that's um, of interest to you. We can go to the next slide. 
So in summary, I know that was a, a quick rundown of kind of the, the problem space in industry um, and the some of the solution assets that we have to help meet, meet this need in industry to close that gap. Um, we're live now. Even if your endpoints or your app are totally baked and ready, you can still commit to entering the utility by the enforcement deadline, or uh, you know, which is July 2021. Um, and you know, we can we can post you on our web page saying that you've um, you've committed, which I think is a really important important piece of this, right? And also in spreading, helping to spread the word to other plans and third-party app vendors. This, this in itself, it, you know, will accelerate adoption towards establishing the solution as a national, in, a national utility and ensuring that scale that's really key to um, industry moving forward towards fire adoption and that success. So again, I, I invite you to um, to check out our webpage. Um, you can go to the solutions part of the website and then see Acreage Endpoint Directory to um, to find out more. And please be in touch with us if you have any questions um, or are interested in any way. I will now pass it over to CQH Core Manager Emily Tenick. Thanks, Rachel. So now we're going to transition to the CQH core operating rules under development, and we'll kick things off with attachments. Um, when we refer to attachments, we're really talking about the exchange of patient-specific medical information or supplemental documentation to support an administrative healthcare transaction, such as um, prior authorization or a claim. So attachments really serve as that bridge between clinical and administrative data. And as many of you know, I'm sure there are many ways to exchange attachments and a variety of attachment standards that are available. And given this variability, the attachments process continues to be highly manual and a considerable source of administrative burden for plans and providers. And we also know that without a HIPAA mandated standard for attachments, there hasn't really been um, a concerted effort to establish a uniform approach to supporting clinical documentation requested by health plans. So the HHS Unified Agenda did announce that an attachment NPRM may be published in early 2021, but um, hasn't been published to date. So we continue to monitor that development um, as we uh, continue with our initiative. So CORE has worked for the past several years on addressing the issues surrounding attachments, and then in July 2020, officially launched its attachment subgroup. Next slide. Um, so as just mentioned, CORE launched the attachment subgroup, um, and its initial focus was on prior authorization, um, prior authorization use case. And the subgroup completed its initial phase of work in Q1 of this year, um, which resulted in an initial draft of infrastructure and data content requirements for attachments, um, the prior authorization use case. So then in blue, you can see the subgroup transitioned to focus on drafting rule requirements for attachments to support healthcare claims. And this is where our attachments effort is currently. Um, following this attachment subgroup, um, the draft rules will be forwarded to a review work group where the group will review both the draft attachments, prior authorization, and attachments claims rule sets together to really ensure consistency and parity across the rule sets as we prepare for um, the final CAQH core vote at the end of the rule at the end of the year, um, as Aaron uh, alluded to. So, we expect the review work group to um, begin their work in Q3 of this year to, to really um, get started on that work. Next slide, please. So again, there are two draft attachments rules that were developed in the attachments prior authorization use case, um, infrastructure and data content. And many of the draft requirements included in the attachments per authorization rules um, will mirror the draft attachment claims use case requirements that are still under development. So as we 
briefly go through um, the requirements here um, that were developed for prior authorization. Um, know that a lot of these will also be included in the claims use case. Uh, before we start, I'd like to highlight that the subgroup chose to pursue draft requirements for both the X12 payload format and the non-X12 payload format. Um, we'll go through that in a little more detail, but just want to note that here up front. So the key infrastructure requirements that were pursued by the subgroup included um, system availability and reporting, connectivity, payload acknowledgement and response time, um, minimums for document size and amount of data that must be supported and accepted by both front end servers and internal document management systems, um, data error handling, and also companion guide requirements. So a long list, but all of these requirements align um, seamlessly with existing core operating rules. A lot of those rules that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and those of you familiar with core infrastructure rules will again recognize many of the requirements I just listed. Um, the rules also align with connectivity version four updated just last year. Um, and then specifically again with the prior authorization infrastructure and data content rules and the healthcare claims infrastructure rule. So transitioning to the data content rule requirements, um, reassociation was the key area the subgroup focused on for requirement development. Um, for example, requiring the use of code EL um, when using the X12 format and establishing consistent reference data to simplify reassociation. So once again, these requirements are drafted for the attachment prior authorization use case right now, but Similar requirements are in development and review uh, in the claims use case subgroup, um, along with additional claims specific requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the top of that last slide, um, the draft attachments infrastructure and data content requirements include two distinct methods for sending additional information or documentation, the X12 method and the non-X12 method. So on this slide, um, we detail the X12 method, which is um, attachments exchanged using core connectivity as the payload exchange method, and the X12275 transaction as the attachment payload format. Then any type of payload type may be embedded in the BDS segment. For example, that could include um, HL7C CDAs, fire resources, PDFs, um, et cetera. So the workflow depicted here provides just a visual example of what the X12 method looks like um, and highlights where those payload exchange, payload format, payload types um, fit in. But uh, this is again just an example of of attachments um, solicited by the health plan to support a healthcare claim in this particular case. Next slide, please. So the non X12 method, also included in the draft rules, um, uses core connectivity as the exchange method as well, but it does not use the X12 to 75 transaction um, as a payload format. So that gray color um, is not included in this diagram as it was on the previous slide. And again, since core connectivity version four um, includes requirements for both SOAP and REST and is payload agnostic, any payload type can be exchanged here um, in this non x method. So again, HL7 CCDAs, fire resources, um, and on and on. So the draft attachment requirements for both uh, PA and claims use cases can apply to both of these methods. Next slide, please. Okay, and um, so as we are still getting started with the claims use case, I'd just like to highlight what's in scope for that use case. Um, and for the X12 transaction um, from that perspective, the following transactions are in scope. And those include the 277 healthcare claim request for additional information, 
275 um, attachment transaction, the 824 application advice, the 837 healthcare claims, including institutional, professional, and dental, and the 999 functional acknowledgement. So as we saw on the previous slide, the draft requirements may also apply to other payload types, um, HL7 fire resources, PDFs, and to non-X12 payload exchange scenarios such as core connectivity and fire. Um, so those are optionally in scope as well. Um, and then the extra transactions that are out of scope for the claims use case are already addressed in existing core operating rules. So those are the ones you see listed here, um, 276, 277 uh, claim status request and response, the 277 claim acknowledgement, and the 835 um, payment remittance advice. So we're still in the process of developing the attachments claims use case requirements. Um, and then again, we'll move to the rules work group where we'll review the attachments requirements for PA and claims together. So if you're interested in joining um, this initiative, please do reach out to CORE for more information. Um, we'd, we'd be happy to have you. And with that, I think um, I'll now hand the call to Taha Andrewala, CORE Senior Manager, to continue our discussion. Taha? Thanks, Emily. Um, so I'd like to uh, now kind of dive in into uh, CAQ's CORE's eligibility and benefit rule update. So I'll spend the, uh, the first few minutes talking about the existing rule requirement, then moving into the scope of you know, what we're looking to do to in updating the operating rule for in 2021, walk through kind of our roadmap and then talk about uh, adoption impl implementations and then put a spotlight on um, the telemedicine, um, and, you know, the telemedicine initiative that we're working on as part of the rule update. So to kind of start off with um, and level set, the CAQH core eligibility and benefit operating rules really enhance the exchange of eligibility information between health plans and providers through uh, consistent infrastructure and data content requirements um, that really aim to include the exchange of patient financial information as part of that transaction. Um, so look, looking at that, um, on the slide, you can see we have a list of detailed operating rule requirements that are part of the rule. And the first, the, you know, the first requirement that, that the rule requires is that when a health plan, um, when a provider sends an inquiry, it's really important for a provider to know like the name of the health plan that's covering the individual. So that's really important as part of the transaction. The next operating rule requirement really requires the return of certain data elements in response to either a generic or explicit eligibility and benefit inquiry. And this includes, um, you know, providing uh, patient financial information such as uh, copayments, deductibles, base deductibles. Uh, for a certain defined set of service types. So CORE has defined uh, 51 service type codes that require the return of that patient financial information. And this is really important as when, um, you know, as a, as a patient, you go to the doctor, you'll know what your copay and co-insurance amount is upfront at the time of service. And that really helps improve uh, and, uh, and streamline the revenue cycle management um, for, uh, within, a, uh, within a provider. And then the other um, operating rule that uh, requirement that really benefits from this is being able to differentiate between in-network in and out-of-network services. So again, um, you know, that's really important, especially when it comes to patient financial responsibility. Further, um, our existing operating rules really support patient identification by requiring the normalization of last names. So this really is on the back end. Um, you know, when a health plan is really trying to identify and search for a member uh, you know, in order to ascertain the benefits to send back to provider, being able to match a patient is really important. So we have rule requirements that enable that. Um, and then when a member or a health plan cannot be found, um, you know, it's really important for a provider to know, you know, what sort of errors may occur um, when they're not receiving the proper information or benefits. So we have rule requirements around AAA error, error code reporting that really helps to promote that. And the last requirement I like to highlight really applies to vendors, and this operating rule requirement requires vendors to be able to detect, to extract, and display all data elements that CORE has operating rules for. This really helps to ensure providers are able to have um, adequate access to the eligibility and benefit information as um, required by the operating rules. 
So on the next slide, I'd like to walk through, um, you know, I've just reviewed the existing um, rule requirements that were first published by Kitchikar nearly 15 years ago. And this rule set has been updated over time. And, you know, as the industry has evolved over the last several years, stakeholders are now requiring more robust and enhanced eligibility information pertaining to eligibility, coverage, and benefit information. So as a result, in, um, last, at the, in fall of last year, CORE asked its membership to identify, you know, what are some of the priority areas for operating rule development that, that CFH CORE and its participants could work on in 2021? And CORE participants identified improving eligibility and benefit processes as the top priority area. So, um, you know, as you can see on this on the slide, uh, you know, to, CORE is now working on updating eligibility and benefit um, operating rules and core recently launched an eligibility and benefit task group to evaluate eight opportunity areas that you see on the slide so the scope of the task group that that is now uh con that is now convened is really looking at these eight opportunity areas um to examine you know is are these industry priorities you know are these um really important for um the for uh, the industry to update so I'll, i'm going to walk through these eight areas so the first area is um looking at number one, addressing the industry need to communicate benefit information related to, to telemedicine. And I'll dive into a spotlight on this a little bit later on. The second opportunity area relates to, to expansion of the number of service type codes that uh, require explicit inquiries beyond the 51 that is currently required by, via the existing operating rules. Opportunity areas number three and four include providing eligibility information related to memberships and tier benefit plans and the potential for responding to coverage uh, and benefit requests for either a certain procedure uh, or diagnosis code. Opportunity area number five includes the communicating the number of visits or services left on a benefit. So for example, the number of physical therapy sessions left or speech therapy sessions left on a particular benefit. Uh, opportunity area number six includes the sharing of eligibility and benefit data between health plans and their members. So members are able to have a transparency, you know, if they're eligible um, for a level of care or what, you know, the, their expected patient responsibility may be, such as a copay, coinsurance, or deductible before going to a provider for a visit. Opportunity area number seven really looks at and looks at including additional dental specific eligibility information. And opportunity area eight includes the communication of uh, whether or not prior authorization may be required for a certain procedure or service type. So again, these are the eight opportunity areas that core participants are, are going to be working on and really trying to define and determine, um, you know, which of these should be included as part of our uh, rule update for, for 2021. So on the next slide, you can see a roadmap of where, uh, you know, the where we are in the overall process of benefit update and how it fits into the overall uh, core rule development process. So Syracuse Core started the rule development effort by sending out an opportunity area survey to all core participating organizations in March uh, of this year to really identify the potential topics to include as part of the rule update. And I just reviewed those eight opportunity areas that, uh, that we asked core participants to evaluate. So currently where we are today is that um, the eligibility and benefit task group which is currently launched is really working to identify, discuss, and define operating rule requirements to include uh, what, as part of the rule update. And we're really in the early stages of this. Um, so, uh, you know, as we work through over the next several months and after the task group completes its work in September, the updated rule will be forwarded to a review work group uh, for a review in October. And then once the review work group completes its review, we'll conduct a formal ballot and uh, move those draft rules to a final core vote, which is expected to take place in mid Q4 2021. Um, so if your organization is looking into contributing into this rule development effort, you know, please contact CORE. We would be happy to have you on board and um, uh, to really work on this important topic. So on the next slide, I'd like to spend a moment talking about the impact that the eligibility and benefit transaction and operating rules have on the healthcare industry. So currently, per federal mandates, implementation and, um, of the eligibility and benefit operating rules, the existing ones that I went over on the first slide, and the standard transaction is a requirement for all HIPAA-covered health entities. So this really highlights the importance and high adoption 
that these rules and standards have on the healthcare industry. And for context on, a, on adoption, according to the 2020 index, the eligibility and benefit verification is really the highest volume transaction measured in the medical industry with electronic adoption being at 84%. Further looking at uh, market share for the operating rules in particular um, as tracked by core certification, nearly 188 million lives benefit from the efficiencies afforded by the operating rules really those uh, 180, 188 million lives really, um, you know, providers are able to get patient financials for those and really to get uh, really robust and uh, eligibility and benefit information for that. So as, you know, what does this mean? So as core participant, participants work to update rule requirements, a big question that we receive is since existing rule requirements are federally mandated, what would industry adoption and implementation look like for the updated requirements? So once the updated rule is approved via the core rule de development process, the updated rule will be integrated into the core certification and recertification program. So this help effort really will help to promote, build, and progress market adoption on a voluntary basis of the updated or new operating rule requirements over time. Um, and we'll hear more about the core certification and recertification requirements later on. So essentially, you know, as the rule, the new rule is approved, the idea is that we'll have a uh, you know, for, for uh, future adoption via the certification. So on the next slide, um, I'd like to, you know, uh, put a spotlight on telemedicine. So, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, as that core sent out an opportunity area survey to core participants. And as part of that survey, core asked respondents questions related to telemedicine. And I'd like to provide a spotlight on some of these, uh, the results that we received. So a large proportion of respondents, uh, nearly 93%, indicated that they see value in having uniform requirements for communicating telemedicine-specific eligibility and benefit information. Um, you know, as currently identified by respondents, there is really no uniform method for returning telemedicine coverage information between a health plan and provider, as the industry is using a variety of different service type codes and um, uh, identification of different message segment responses. Um, and 73% of respondents indicated that they currently support the exchange of telemedicine benefits via the um, X12 version 5010-270-271 transaction. Again, although nearly three quarters of respondents are were exchanging telemedicine information based off survey results and the comments we received, there was really high variation in the type of information being exchanged, uh, posing challenges to um, standardization. And surprisingly, although there is there's guidance um, uh, via X12, via the request for inf information process on how to best return telemedicine be benefits, only 46% of uh, survey respondents were really aware of that guidance and recommendation from X12 on how to return those benefits. So those are some of the key findings from the survey that will really guide and um, will guide the opportunity area and rule development process as that that task group that I talked about works on um, building out requ rule requirements for telemedicine as part of the rule update. So um, I think that's all I have for eligibility and benefit up the update. So I'd like to hand the call back over to Daphne. Thank you, Taha. So we'll take a brief pause in the presentation and I will launch this poll. Uh, we wanna hear from you about what drives your consideration to implement new uh, CAQH core operating roles within your organization. So I'll give you all a few more seconds to respond. Okay. Now I'll share the poll. Um, and Erin, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any, any, any thoughts on the results here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously a lot of people think their, of their first priority is making sure they're in compliance with everything um, that is out there. So if this makes total sense to me, um, reduction in administrative burden, um, also very important and key that folks are seeing uh, value in their implementation of the operating rules. And I think this indicates that. Um, and goes back to, um, you know, some of the things that Taha mentioned around uh, continually tracking data to make sure we're seeing that ROI. So, um, 
say something we want to repeat that Thanks, Darren. Uh, and this is actually a perfect segue into our final portion of today's presentation. Uh, we're going to hear from Adam Nichols, CAQH Core Senior Associate. Adam, take it away. Thanks, Daphne. Today I'd like to dive into core certification, recertification, and the benefits of the prior authorization operating role implementation. So uh, to start, the core certification program has been around since 2007 and has provided a means of operating role uh, for implementers to validate and demonstrate that their systems are in conformance with the rules through certification and testing. So this certification program was developed by the industry for the industry through a transparent multi-stakeholder process, uh, the same process as the operating rules. Essentially, the core certification program is designed to ensure the IT systems and products are aligned with federally recognized and industry developed operating roles and underlying standards. Um, on the other side, recertification is another important certification component um, as uh, this, this is to ensure that there is an ongoing conformance to the operating roles over time. As technology evolves and, and really markets change, uh, this is important, especially as operating role compliance is being enforced by the federal government and certification being required for health plan contracts. So as you can see on this slide, um, over uh, 381 certifications have been issued to date, representing over 188 million lives and nearly 100 clearinghouses and vendor products. So looking at the next slide, a key enhancement that CAQH Core made recently uh, to the certification program in 2020 was adding in the requirements for recertification. We believe that with evolving technologies, mergers, and acquisitions and system upgrades, there's a need to assess ongoing conformance with the operating rules to maintain program integrity. Further, certification enables organizations to align with healthcare needs for operating roles when the operating role requirements are updated over time. In terms of timelines, core certified entities will be required to recertify every three years. These renewals may recur at any time during the calendar year based off of the initial year of core certification. After communicating an intent to recertify, recertification testing must be completed within 180 days. If there is a lapse in renewing the certification, CAQH core will need to pursue with engaging in an organization on, on the decertification process. Any updates to the CAQH core operating roles will be incorporated within the recertification process, and at a minimum, entities must implement versions of the operating roles that have been published 24 months prior to the core certification seal renewal date. Meaning, as organizations approach their recertification dates, they must consider and evaluate if they will need to implement new or updated operating role requirements in order to recertify. And Recertification is now required. So if you're an organization that was issued an initial certification prior to 2014, uh, you must recertify by the end of this year to keep your certification active. So if you're a core certified organization, feel free to contact us if you're unsure on whether or not you need to recertify. Bye. Looking at the next slide. So as the industry implements operating roles and standards, the need to the needs to measure impact is critical to understand the ROI and overall success. Currently, via core certification, core tracks the number of covered lives that benefit from the administrative efficiencies afforded by operating roles and underlying standards. These results are published in an annual core certification progress report that captures the market reach and impact of the core operating roles on the healthcare system. CORE is introducing a new measurement component as part of the CORE certification program as really a way to further enhance the value of the CORE certification process. CORE will embed the collection of efficiency metrics into the CORE certification process to support organizations in measuring impacts of their operating role implementations. The goal of this effort is really to support priorities to track and articulate the impact of the operating roles have on operational and workflow improvements. As an optional benefit, 
core certified organizations will be provided opportunities to receive benchmark reports, which would allow organizations to compare their progress to other organizations in the overall industry. And, other, and another benefit is uh, there's an opportunity to engage in a one-on-one -on -one case studies with CORE that further measure the impact of operating rules and standards on the efficiency metrics and staff experience. And looking at the next slide here, so on, on this slide, I'd like to note the growing adoption of one of the latest operating rules where the commercial market of prior authorization and referral adoption has grown by 14% and health plans, vendors, and clearinghouses that you can see here are benefiting from the core certification implementation. Implementing the prior authorization operating rules ensures electronic prior authorization information is shared in an organized, trusted, and consistent way. This improves member matching, provider matching, error, and error messaging, and then it also helps identify needed additional documentation to support a prior authorization request. And Please reach out to CAQH core team if your organization conducts the prior authorization and referrals transaction and is interested in learning more about how to become core certified. And, and with that said, I'll hand the call back over to you, Daphne. Thanks, Adam. And as a almost seamless follow-up, I will launch a poll here on the prior authorization operating rules. Uh, this is going to allow us to internally assess uh, our outreach and education around the importance of, of these, these operating rules. Thank you all for the feedback. And without further ado, I will bring us into the audience Q&A. As a quick reminder, please submit your questions by typing them into the questions panel on the dashboard. So let's dive right in with our first question on attachments. Um, I'll send this one to Emily. How do you expect CORE's attachment work to evolve uh, if there is a federal attachment standard named? Yeah, thanks, Daphne. Um, that's a great question. Um, the core staff and our subgroup co-chairs today, uh, as I mentioned, continue to monitor the the development of the standard um, and strategically built in the review work group to ensure that um, our draft rules align should any standard be published um, mid rule development. But CORE also does have a detailed maintenance process to update CQH CORE operating rules as needed. So um, that's that's absolutely something that we've considered as um, as you know, we, we wait for the standard to, to drop. Um, and then as mentioned in the attachments portion of today's call, we are pursuing the X12 and non X12 methods um, in the draft rules. So this really is going to allow us some flexibility to pivot and ensure alignment um, with the standard as we continue to monitor that. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Emily. Next question here. Are there any pairs that are following the core authorization guidelines? Hi. So I, can, I, can, I can take that one, Daphne. So for prior authorization, we do have uh, several pairs that have implemented the prior authorization uh, rules. Um, I believe on a few slides back, we ha highlighted some of those payers, and those um, you can actually see uh, a full list of core certified payers for a prior authorization on our website. Thanks, Taha. And one final question here. I'll send this, this one to you, Aaron. Um, I know you spoke about the various telemedicine uh, initiatives. Uh, that CORE is undertaking right now, but could you give us a more general um, overview of where you believe that CAQH is heading in, in this shift towards telemedicine and what our, our role will be? Sure, thanks, Daphne. I, I think it'll 
you know, we'll use the same parameters and criteria as we always do to consider um, the need for new operating rules or at the broader CHPH level, new utilities or updates to existing utilities. You know, is there an ROI? Is there a benefit to the industry to have a, a uniform approach? So anytime we hear challenges from plans or providers about uh, disparate methods for doing something and with regard to telemedicine, perhaps it's billing codes or, or other items, um, we will look into it to see if there is opportunity to bring the industry together to reduce the burden. So we'll, we'll continue with that approach. And, and if you all are seeing any of those challenges in your day-to-day -day lives, we definitely want to hear about it. Thanks, Erin. I know we're coming up on our time together here. So just wanted to share a couple of upcoming webinars uh, in June. So on June 3rd, we're hosting a webinar on BDP uh, with Troy Smith from Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, who's also a core board member. And then on the 22nd, we're hosting a webinar with Nacha and Instamed. So more information to come there, and we really hope you'll join us. As a reminder, the Weed Spring Conference is taking place from May 17th to 21 to, to, to the 21st. So we'll see, hope to see you at, then as well. Finally, I wanted to share um, some of the benefits of joining CORE as a participating organization. The most meaningful part of joining us is that you get to work with other industry leaders to drive rural development efforts that really help bring the industry forward and, and shape the industry. Finally, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Once I end today's session, you'll see an end of webinar survey. I know we went through a lot of topics today and we wanna hear your feedback and questions. Additionally, please feel free to email us at, at core at caqh.org if you would like more information on operating rule development or any other CAQH core activities. Have a great rest of your day and thanks again for joining us.